to welcome Dr. Matthew Agawala uh, from the University of Cambridge and Professor Tim Jackson uh, from the University of Surrey. And I'd just like you briefly to introduce yourselves and explain why this topic is of interest to you. And we'll start with you, Matthew. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to share uh, the work that we've done uh, at the University of Cambridge. Um, my name is Matthew. I'm an economist. And my research and my team's research focuses on how we can develop economic statistics and measurements that are fit for guiding policy through the challenges we face in the 21st century. So how can we develop economic measures that reflect our social infrastructure, our natural environment, and the level of inequality and how that plays through the rest of the economy? Thank you. And uh, Tim Jackson. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Tim Jackson, I'm a professor of sustainable development at the University of Surrey, where I lead a research group center called the Center for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity. So what prosperity means, how you measure it, and so on is our, is our bread and butter. And I, I guess my interest in this started when I was economics commissioner on the Sustainable Development Commission between 2004 and about 2011, I think it was. And I was just trying to remember, I think this might be my third EAC inquiry into um, the, the measurement of, of progress and the role of the GDP in particular. And one of those, the first one of those was actually back in the days of the SDC, 2008, I think, from memory, something like that. So it, it's, it's, for me, it's, uh, it's been a lifelong query into uh, what prosperity means and how we measure it. Well, I'm sorry we keep asking you back to discuss the same <laughs> topic. I'm really glad you do. It's not a problem. But, but it may reflect the fact that uh, we are we are very interested in the topic, and we sense that the government is becoming interested in it too. So now I think is perhaps a more topical time to be discussing it than some of your earlier appearances. Very good. And, and maybe that's what should sort of start our, our my line of questioning, if I may. I mean, we as a committee uh, regard ourselves as the uh, scrutineers of government on its... Uh, progress towards net zero Britain, and we think that's an important role for the committee uh, uh, for the rest of this parliament. And an, a critical part of that, as was clear from our presidency of COP26, which obviously continues till November, is the whole taxonomy, uh, the whole measurement and metrics of, uh, of how do we um, decarbonize our economies and hold governments to account for meeting the commitments and the ambitions that they've set out. Perhaps I should start with, uh, with Matthew and, and ask you whether um, you think that the current measurements of uh, economic success uh, take into account sufficiently the role that's required in order to achieve a, a decarbonized economy. Uh, well, thank you very much. It's a great question um, and one that I've worked on for at least the past decade or so. Um, the reality is that GDP, gross domestic product, remains the primary indicator um, of economic progress. At least that's what we think if we read the newspaper, if we listen to governments, if we um, listen to reports about whether or not there's been progress. The problem, though, is that GDP was a statistic, it was a measure developed in the 20th century for measuring 20th century progress and for guiding policy with 20th century solutions to 20th century problems. And what were the big problems at the time? Well, people didn't have enough stuff. People were hungry. We didn't have food security in much of the world. People didn't have enough clothes. Um, there was a relatively poor population for much of the 20th century. What are the problems that we see now? Well, they're completely different in their structure, and therefore they're different in the way that we ought to measure them and the way that we ought to develop solutions to address them. GDP growth brought about lots of great things. We saw incomes grow. We saw uh, access to food, access to education, access to medicine improve. We saw life expectancy ex extended in all parts of the world. Now, unequally, definitely, but in all parts of the world. The problem is that alongside these 
undeniable improvements in the human condition. GDP growth also released one and a half trillion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere and drove over a million species to the brink of extinction. We have seen rising inequality, and these three, the climate, the biodiversity, and the inequality crises that we face, uh, could ultimately wipe out an entire century worth of gain. GDP won't tell us anything about that. GDP is inherently backwards looking. In a world when innovation and technology and AI and automation are running away at ever faster paces and where financial transactions are measured in nanoseconds, we have an economic measurement system that tries to tell us what happened last quarter or maybe last year. We're looking backwards when we ought to be looking forwards. And the problem here is that GDP is a flow measure. It tells us after the fact, what did we do last quarter? Or what did we do last year? We can't build forward if we're always looking backwards. We need a new economic model. So, so that's a great critique of the system that we have at the moment. But it seems to me that you're calling for a forward-looking measure, which governments uh, are not very good at doing. In fact, nobody's very good at looking forwards in any credible way. Um, economists, you know, forgive me, but economists often get it wrong. In fact, more often than not, get it wrong. So are you advocating an entirely new approach to, uh, to forward-looking measurement as well as advocating introducing some element of sustainability into the metric? Yes, I'm advocating a forward-looking measure. It's not as um, radical, I think, uh, as, as it may sound. It's simply measuring capital, measuring assets, measuring wealth. Any measure of capital is inherently forward-looking. The way I like to describe it, imagine you're running a bakery. The size of the pie you can produce in the future depends on the stock of ingredients in your pantry. Run out of ingredients in your pantry, tomorrow's pie is smaller. No question. The economy works in exactly the same way, except the ingredients of our economic pantry, the things that comprise economic prosperity, they're not milk and eggs and butter, they are wealth. They are a stable climate system, healthy ecosystems, our natural assets. They are our human assets, the health and education and skills of our population, our human assets. It's our physical infrastructure, and it is our social infrastructure, our social capital, the strength of communities, the degree of trust that people have in each other with business and in government. That is what makes up the economic pantry. If we measure our economic pantry, then we have a forward-looking measurement. All of those assets are defined in terms of their contributions into the future. This is no different from the way that every business on the planet operates. Think Thomas well, what, Cook. What one big difference might be that you'd, you'd value, na value natural resources uh, if you were taking a balance sheet approach which could give to a complete distortion of actually the, uh, the, the current annual contribution to the global economy. So, you know, Saudi Arabia would suddenly go to number one of the league table because it's got more value locked up in oil and gas reserves under its sand than any other country. Russia would probably be number two. Is, is, that, what, is that how you see the consequence of such a balance sheet approach? Not at all. Um, the purpose of the balance sheet approach is that you think about these assets as a portfolio. And so if we take the Saudi Arabia example, we would show actually that Saudi Arabia's wealth would be lower than it is currently recorded. And it would be lower because we would be factoring in the value of the emissions embedded in their subsoil assets, which would reduce the, the balance sheet book value of their assets and bring it more in line with what the scientists tell us. These carbon uh, molecules going out into the atmosphere decrease all of our potential. They affect all of the other assets. Climate change is going to affect physical infrastructure, human capital, the skills of the population, the health of the population. 
what I'm advocating for is no different from what Professor Sarpartha Dasgupta advocated for in the Dasgupta Review. It's that we measure our economic pantry, our wealth, alongside measures like GDP. Okay. Thank you. We're going to come on to Professor Dasgupta in a moment. Um, Tim, the, the government, this government says uh, regularly that we've succeeded in, uh, in growing our economy at the same time as cutting emissions significantly by uh, exiting coal as a source of generation effectively and uh, uh, you know, creating a, more renewables more quickly than other countries, certainly in Europe. Um, do, do you see that? Um, uh, do you see continuing to grow GDP as compatible with achieving the economic um, the sustainability challenge that the government has presented itself with? Uh, no, in broad terms, I don't. Um, I mean, I did a lot of work on the numbers on this, the rates of decoupling that would have to be achieved while GDP was still growing, and assumptions, typical economic assumptions of 2% per year growth in the GDP, um, lead to uh, essentially historically never achieved and conceptually extremely difficult rates of decarbonisation, particularly if we want to meet the, or, or to keep 1.5 alive, um, which really, even for a country that has decoupled its production-based emissions faster than many other countries, as the UK has done, is still reliant on imports of carbon-intensive goods, which are not factored into that equation. And it also has a historical responsibility to the carbon in the atmosphere, which many other countries in the world don't have. When you, when you bring those things together, when you bring together that historical responsibility, the need of poorer countries to develop quite fast, and our own relative position as an advanced economy and a rich advanced economy, I do not think that the UK should be privileging the GDP over and above reaching those carbon targets and keeping 1.5 alive, because the impacts of that in the long term will be disastrous, and they will be measurable not in fractions of a percent of the GDP that we might have to sacrifice now for investment in low carbon opportunities, but in 10, 15, 20 or more percent of the GDP in probably less than half a century's time. So against those future costs, we should not be privileging growth in the GDP over and above our carbon targets. Do you think there's a role for uh, economic policies such as carbon taxes in trying to decouple uh, GDP from economic sustainability? Yes, I do. Um, I think the design of those taxes and instruments is extremely important, um, particularly given the impact that they may have on poorer households. Um, and I believe that they are one of a number of instruments that can be put in play to reduce our carbon intensity, to incentivize investment in low carbon renewable technologies, and to protect the livelihoods of the people who will be working in a net zero carbon economy. Thank you. I'm going to move on now. I know Chairman McCrory has to leave shortly, so over to you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That's very kind. Um, just wanted if you could expand a little bit. Uh, we've talked about many of the limitations that uh, GDP has. Could you, uh, Matthew, um, tell me a little bit about the benefits of GDP? Obviously, we've talked about why we have it now, but what potentially are the benefits of going forward with GDP, or are there none? Um, well, like I said, GDP growth has come alongside lots of very substantial improvements at an unprecedented pace. Over the past 120 years, um, the increases in life expectancy, in incomes, in literacy, in access to health care and medication, um, that's unprecedented. It's at a pace that we haven't seen even in a thousand years before. Um, so GDP growth has come alongside lots of great things. It's also come alongside lots of terrible things that really genuinely threaten to wipe out all of those gains in all parts of the world. Um, there's lots of stuff in GDP that I want to see more of. Uh, more books and more music being made and uh, I'd, I'd like to see people going camping and traveling and, and visiting the coast. There's lots of things in GDP which we really do want more of. There's lots of things, though, in GDP which 
undeniably, unquestionably, we want less mm. of. When we have to pay lots of money to clean up after an expensive oil spill, GDP goes up. In the United States, after a mass shooting, gun sales go up, GDP goes up. This is insane. We shouldn't be trying to boost that kind of statistic. The reality is, whether you are pro-growth, whether you are post-growth, or whether you are anti-growth, if you are basing your argument and your measurement in terms of GDP, you've already lost the plot. It's the wrong measure. We need to focus on the pantry. We need to focus on that core set of assets, nature, people, our social relationships, our trust, and our physical infrastructure. And we need to think about them as a portfolio. So going back to that economic pantry analogy, you said before that if you have fewer ingredients in the pantry, you can have to make a smaller pie. So therefore, if you have more, you, you're saying you would automatically make a big pie. Is that true? Are humans inherently greedy enough that that's the way we have to go, and therefore we have to force in social and natural um, uh, um, uh, capital as well as, as well as GDP? Well, I think you need to measure the entire portfolio of assets, everything in the pantry together. Because this way, when you invest in physical infrastructure, like airports and roads, you will have to deduct the negative impact that this physical infrastructure has on nature mm -hmm. through the carbon emissions embodied Sorry in the to interrupt materials. you. Is that something we can measure when people are for making that forecast? I think that's what I'm trying to get at. Oh, yes. These are things yeah. that we can measure. In fact, the UK is uh, amongst the best in the world at measuring natural capital. I work uh, and, and advise uh, the United Nations Statistics Commission on the development of natural capital accounts, environmental economic accounts. Uh, and I work with statistical bodies all around the world. The UK, without doubt, is amongst the top in the world at doing this. Yeah. And social capital? Uh, social capital, uh, we are currently where natural capital was about 30 years ago. Um, the UK actually does have better social capital accounting metrics uh, than most countries. Uh, in fact, last year we developed uh, with the Government Statistics Service and the Office for National Statistics a harmonized set of social capital metrics that can be used across government. Uh, we have some of the richest data in the world. We have weekly surveys on trust in the UK. This is hugely important. It's a tremendous asset. One of the things that we ought to consider is how do we manage our statistical infrastructure, the, the ability to develop and compile data and use it. We've seen over the past two years how quickly everybody in the country started talking about data and statistics on a daily basis. We have professionals at the Office for National Statistics and they are brilliant. We need to invest in that infrastructure. Thank you. Tim, I wonder if you could expand an, uh, a little bit on the, what the risks are if we carry on with business as usual and we don't take into account more of the social mm. and natural capital in this. Let, let, me, let me start by perhaps adding a little bit to, to what Matthew said about the limitations because it, it, it isn't just that kind of pantry analogy. It, it is also about distribution of those assets yes. and distribution of those incomes. And that is a, a huge influence on social capital, for example. Um, when you have an unequal society, social capital begins to disintegrate, health outcomes begin to fall, mental health begins to fall, and the distribution of the GDP does not appear in the statistic anywhere. It's just not there. It's invisible. We're measuring an average wealth of the average person in the country, and we know that those averages don't exist, and we also know that the distribution of incomes across the economy has changed radically over the last half century or so. And um, as Matthew said, you know, it's, 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 the GDP has a job to do. It measures the busyness of the economy overall, but it doesn't measure those changes in its asset base, the, the using up of the ingredients in the pantry. It doesn't measure the distribution of assets in the economy. It doesn't measure non-market goods. Mm -hmm. And, and it's very interesting that non-market goods in particular include the work that people put into households. And it's very interesting also that most of that work is done by women. Mm -hmm. So the GDP is a measure which systematically disadvantages and devalues the work of women in the economy. And in particular, of course, the work of 
care in the economy, which is not solely the preserve of women, but women do contribute most to, and which is the foundation for all of the wealth and all of the productivity that we have. Without caring for our children, without caring for ourselves when we're sick, without caring for the elderly population, it is not possible to think about a productive economy in any meaningful sense of the word, and yet most of that is either invisible within the GDP or has an extremely low value within the GDP. These are serious limitations, and as Matthew says, you know, the, the measurement of, of, of social capital is difficult, but the measurement of inequality is actually very precise. And there are some very precise ways in which we could be measuring inequality and factoring that measurement into our measurement of the GDP. In fact, there was an example. Uh, we did a study for uh, the all-party parliamentary group on limits to growth on distribution and inequality a couple of years ago. And, and using the late Tony Atkinson's measure of the welfare measure, the welfare lost through inequality, we worked out that around 12.5% of the GDP is lost in welfare terms. And just to put that in perspective, that's about twice the budget of the NHS mm -hmm. from having an unequal economy. So these are serious economic and social losses by not using the wrong measure. I wouldn't advocate doing away with the GDP because it's a good measure of busyness, but using it for the wrong purposes, for setting our policies and, and measuring our progress. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Claudia Webb. Claudia. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and this is a fascinating debate. Thank you for what you're telling us. Can I just um, ask uh, Professor Jackson, if I could ask you to just share a bit more about the alternatives to GDP uh, and break it down for us. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've looked at this for quite a long time and, um, and broadly speaking, you, you can think of, of four or five different ways, different alternatives to the GDP and one of them is the kind of dashboard approach. It's a dashboard of indicators um, which tells you you know, what your climate's doing, what your health indicators are doing, what your inequality indicators are doing, what your air pollution looks like, yes, what your incomes are doing, but also what the distribution of those incomes is doing. So this dashboard approach is most uh, famous in, in its incarnation in New Zealand, the Living Standards Framework. And, and what's most telling, I think, about that dashboard approach, because we also, interestingly, have a dashboard approach here in the UK that was put together while I was Economics Commissioner on the Sustainable Development Commission, and I was partly involved in that work, but it's hidden somewhere in the depths of the ONS as a set of indicators that never fully reaches the policy light of day. And that's very, very important. In New Zealand, the approach has been that that living standards framework sits inside Treasury, and Treasury formulates a well-being budget on the basis of that living standards framework which allocates resources in the directions that the Living Standards Framework points to. So that's approach one, if you like, that dashboard approach. And it's a bit like saying, you know, when you're driving a car, bad analogy in our post-car world, perhaps, um, you don't just look at the rev counter. You also have to look at uh, the direction you're traveling, your indicators, what's happening elsewhere. You need a dashboard of indicators really to steer an economy. Um, properly, and, and that's missing when you focus purely on the GDP. So that non-monetized dashboard is one of the approaches. One of the things you can then do from all those indicators is put them together to aggregate them together in some way. So, um, and, and there are examples of that, such as the Human Development Indi Index um, and the, uh, the Canadian Sustainable Wellbeing Index is an aggregated measure. The reason for putting them together is quite, is quite a fundamental point, which is that there is a natural tension between having robust measures that give you all the information you need and having something which resonates in policy and society. The GDP resonates. It's one single measure that we can apply policies to and make it go in a direction, hopefully, that we want it to go in. With a dashboard of indicators, some are going up, some are going down, policy becomes more complicated and messaging around it also becomes more complicated. And this is an inherent tension in the indicators debate. You want robustness and you also want resonance, but you can't always find them in the same place. So one of the reasons for aggregating some of these together, as they do in the Human Development Index, is that you have a more resonant single overarching indicator. So that's a, an aggregate non-monetized indicator. And then you have 
a set of indicators which are really measuring something very, very different. In 2005, Lord Layard recommended the, the, the measurement of subjective well-being as the policy guide rather than uh, the GDP. And, and his, measure, his argument goes right back to classical economics, that, that the GDP is built out of measuring utility in society. Utility in society is a measure of how, how well off we are what well-being we have, and we should go back to the source. We should measure that. So, in fact, during um, the period when the dashboard of indicators that the ONS still works on was being put together, there was the inclusion within that dashboard of indicator number 68 in the Sustainable Development Indicators set, which measures subjective well-being, and DEFRA and ONS have been doing that, making that measurement. So that's a, a completely different measure. It measures reports of how well people are in various aspects of their lives. And then a fourth component is to aggregate some of those non-monetary indicators, but to add prices to them in the sort of way that Matthew was talking about, and come up with something that might look like a GDP, because it's one number, um, but it takes account of the depreciation of assets, of the inequality in society and indeed of the running down of all kinds of natural, social and human capital, or indeed it's building up. And that's a, a set of indicators that, that has been, I suppose, led by, by uh, an initiative in the United States uh, called the Genuine Progress Indicator, um, which attempts to provide a kind of plug-and-play alternative to the GDP as a single resonant measure of progress. I mean, that, that's, thanks for that. And you've touched on some of the, some of the pitfalls as well, which is quite useful. Um, do you want to expand on, it, on any other aspects of the pitfalls with, with those alternatives? Because I think we've, we've, through your earlier um, presentation, you, you've highlighted the benefits quite well. Yeah. Um, I just want to just be clear about the pitfalls. I think the pitfalls derive from that tension between robustness and resonance. Mm -hmm. um, and as you, as you seek one single resonant indicator that tells you everything you want to know about progress, you have to make decisions about the way that you aggregate those subcomponents of it. Mm -hmm. You may have to make decisions about the pricing of them. Those decisions are not things that are determined in the market, particularly. That's the whole point about them, is they're non-market prices. Um, but they can be, you can, you can make some guesses towards them, as Matthew was saying, you know, we're now pretty good in this country at putting monetary prices on elements of natural capital and finding various techniques to do that. If you think about integrating something like unpaid housework into the accounts, you have to go out looking for what economists call a shadow price, something to give it a sort of value. And if you value that at the wages, actually, of which many housekeepers or house, house cleaners are paid, or, 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 or even less than that because much of it's done for free, that market price doesn't tell you anything about how you might want to include that in your index. So there's various ways that economists have put together um, to, 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 um, to overcome those difficulties they all require some degree of decision-making. And I think I would argue that that is, that is typical of any accounting system that you want to systematize. If you want a set of accounts that is comparable across nations, robust across time, decipherable by different governments, then you have to systematize it in ways that ensure that those decisions that you make about putting indicators together and how you put them together make sense, are scientifically valid, are robust, and continue into the future in a meaningful way. And, and it tells you, I think, most fundamentally that measuring progress is only partly a scientific process. Mm -hmm. It's also a policy process, and that policy process matters in making the decisions that allow you to overcome the difficulties of putting a complex set of individual measures together to give you a way forwards and to understand where progress lies. Thank you. Dr. Um, Agarwala, you, 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 I think, have ad advocated an asset-based system for measuring wealth and prosperity in society. I just want to wonder if you can just share some of the challenges of um, when it comes to looking at social capital 
some of the challenges of getting a reliable and comparable system in relation to social, social capital? Sure. Um, social capital is the one that economists have um, largely dropped the ball on over the past 15 years or so. There, there was quite a bit of activity before then, uh, and there's a bit of uh, more activity in, on the research side more recently. Um, social capital is hard because it's hard to define. Um, it's hard because it's hard to measure, and it's hard because uh, I, I can't really see how there's any credible way of putting a pound sign in front of it. Um, so putting it in an account in the same way you would with physical infrastructure expenditure, it's not going to work. Um, social capital refers to uh, the trust we have amongst individuals, the trust we have in business, the trust we have in government. It's basically... Um, the ability of communities and economies to overcome collective action problems. Social capital is what compelled us to wear masks. Social capital is what uh, convinced us that we should come out and, and clap for the NHS to show some solidarity in the way that we could from our households. That's what social capital does. Social capital is when neighbors and communities come together after a flood or after a fire and help out. Um, and it's unevenly distributed across the UK. We did an analysis uh, based on the number of COVID mutual aid groups that were established across the UK. Uh, and we scaled it so that the results would be comparable. But per local authority, it ranged from somewhere around one per quarter million people in a local authority mm -hmm. to 57. That's a huge disparity in the ability of communities to come together. And when we look at the places that had the highest capacity and the places that had the lowest capacity, and we mapped it out and we laid it over other measures of deprivation and inequality, the results were exactly what we would have expected. The places where people are really hard up were hit hardest by this as well. Um, so what do we do about measuring it? Well, we need regular surveys asking people about trust in the same way that we have regular surveys asking people about their subjective well-being. This is the work that uh, Professor Laird has been doing. The ONS compiles these. The European Social Survey compiles these. Um, we don't have them regularly enough. One of the problems is that trust data tends to come annually, but we know that increases and decreases in trust in government, trust in business, don't play out over just an annual scale. We need more regular, more frequent data. Um, what we see when we analyze the results here in the UK is that uh, trust matters, but one of the biggest things in, social, in measuring social capital in the UK, the biggest determinant is how do you feel in your neighborhood? Do you talk to your neighbors? Can you rely on them? Do you feel your neighborhood belongs to you? The neighborhood is really the biggest contributor and how you feel in your neighborhood to the way that we measure social capital and what defines social capital here in the UK. And that is different, for instance, to the way that it's defined and measured in the United States, where it's much less on the neighborhood and much more on your church community and on the time you spend with your family. And that demonstrates, and I think reflects, cultural differences across countries. And accounting mechanisms ought to be able to do this. In the same way that we measure GDP, all according to the same guidelines, but some countries uh, update the basket of goods for deflating every year, others do it every 10 years, that's okay, even within the GDP measurement. In social capital, we can focus on things that count within our own country and still have a comparable metric. That's, uh, that's uh, I mean, this is a huge challenge because you're there, you're just highlighting there the, just the difficulties measuring it in country, never mind internationally. I mean, just on that sort of the international scope, are there any examples, um, and you've highlighted some already, I think, of where other countries have actually adapted or come up with um, alternatives or, com or comparable measures around GDP which have been successful? I mean, 
would you point us to? Um, I think on if, if we're asking about other countries measuring social capital and, and, and uh, how they do that, we, we get um, we get a, a degree of respite. We, we, we get lucky in that there's one survey question that captures most of the variation in all of the other trust questions and social capital indicators out there. And that is a simple survey question. In general, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you think people can be trusted? And if we get that piece of data, you give me that, I can describe about 50, 55 percent of the variation that comes across an entire panel of questions, about 20 different questions on trust. There's one more question that we can find out, um, which is, uh, covers another 15 or 20 percent of the explanatory power of a much bigger data set. And that's whether people place their trust in people or in institutions. And just those two parameters, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you think people can be trusted? And do you place that trust in people or institutions? Our analysis describes 65 percent of the variation across uh, 20 years of data across 30 European countries. That's quite good. One question can capture an awful lot of information. If you're talking about specifically alternative to GDP, which other countries are um, using an alternative metric, um, I think the New Zealand Living Standards Framework is probably the, the prime example. Uh, yeah, there, I just wanted to say, because there are a few others. So obviously one that's talked about a lot is uh, Bhutan's Gross National Happiness. It's which is a gross national happiness measure, which is a, actually a, a sort of combined dashboard measure um, from Bhutan. But there are, and there are some really good regional examples of using a green GDP. So there's a green GDP in Vermont. There's actually a, um, a bill, I'm not sure on the progress through Congress at the moment, which is arguing that that measure that was used in Vermont should be used across all, uh, across the federal states of America. There, is, um, uh, there are really interesting initiatives. There was an initiative here with the regional development authorities in the late 2000s, I want to say we were involved in it, where the regional development authorities got together as a collective and commissioned some work to come up with a green GDP that they would then integrate into their regional accounting frameworks and progress measurements. And then there are measures which haven't quite come out with a green GDP yet, but which are very definitely in the same space that you are creating here, such as Austria's Growth in Transition uh, initiative, which is now 15 years old, and the Netherlands has just set up um, something which they're calling a broad prosperity, mm -hmm. um, which is their version of a well-being uh, policy, well-being policy and ec economy. And then there are the well-being economy governments, Finland, Scotland, Iceland, New Zealand. I can't remember who else is in that collective. Um, but they are, they are essentially attempting that same task of saying, if we're not leading our policy and our measuring our progress through the GDP, how should we do it? And to me, you know, that is the right place to be at this point in time. There's, as, I, as I said before, there's not something which is an absolute plug-and-play measure, but there is a lot of expertise, as Matthew's been pointing out. There are many practical examples, and there is policy space, it seems to me, that has been created in other countries, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be created here to develop different ways of approaching the measurement of prosperity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think, it, Chair, it might be important, I'm just picking up the study that was done on the mutual aid um, groups that uh, Dr. Agawala mentioned. It would be probably important if we could have a copy of that, if that's possible at all. Um, that would be very helpful. Thank yeah. you, Claudia. Uh, Jerome Mayhew. Jerome. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just picking up on some of the, the, the points you've just made, a fascinating conversation. I confess there were some parts I struggled to follow, but the one of the queries I've got is that if you have a market, mm. uh, a value achieved by a market, then it's a real value, whether it's for the sale of labour. Let, let's, let's talk about employment, actually. So um, whether, you, whether you think it's right that that labour is sold for that hourly rate or not is irrelevant because that's the market. It's established a price. And part of the problem about seeking to add attribute value to other aspects of the economy, which you rightly point to, which are not valued by the market, is, as you also admitted or, or clarified, it's essentially a political decision and not an economic one. 
And my concern is that if you start bringing political decisions into the valuation of uh, you know, economics, then we then move on to the other issue, which is trust. And in this room, we have a, a, a great different number of different approaches to politics and our, our political philosophies, which, undermine, which back them. And yet we all need to agree around some common version of the truth, which is the trust that we place in economic figures. So how do you square that? Mm. How long do we have? <laughs> 30 seconds, because I wasn't meant to ask you that question. <laughs> Um, I, I, I mean, I'd push back a little bit, Jerome, and say that actually you have that problem already with market prices, because market prices are determined by exchanges within markets. The rules of the game in the market are set by political and policy processes. And therefore, you know, take something like care work, for example. The, 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 the wages to the poorest people in, in, in our economy who are doing the most important jobs in the economy are set through... Um, uh, a political process which defines how that market it's operates. What it's, I what mean, it's we, can around, we can argue around the edges, but it's essentially supply and demand, isn't it? I, I, mean, that's I how think. Market works. Well, I, I guess I would argue that that supply and demand curve is shifted by the institutions of the market. The it, it's not a fixed thing. It doesn't exist in, in absolute. It exists in relation to the way in which the economy is is developed. And if you have, for example, a very a set of an economy in which you've got a lot of rich people. Um, who are very secure in their jobs, and a lot of poor people who are very insecure in their jobs, those rich people are able to set the conditions of that market in ways which disadvantage the poor people in the economy. Mm. And if they're very lucky, they're able to engage in policy processes which put those things in law, in legislative frameworks, and therefore you know, hardwire both inequality into our markets and the undervaluing of care. I, I, I know it's, we're, we're, we're time short. Um, but what you're, if I could praise your answer, you're saying it's not that you can defend the politics of the, the assessment of the non-economic value, but it's that the, the market-based values are also political. They're also political. Okay. And, but I would also say, Jerome, one other point, that, that you have mark, what, what you might call market values and then you might have the politis, politicisation of those values. But I think I, I believe in the policy as a process over and above politics as a process. And, and that's what I was pointing to in a sense in relation to the systematization of our accounts because that's what gave us the system of national accounts. It wasn't politicians putting their political views or viewpoints into the, into the building of those national accounts. It was a policy process that underpinned the scientific building of a consistent set of national accounts that we now rely on. It's out of date. It needs changing. The that, policy process... That does bring me neatly forward. onto the area that I should actually have been asking about. Um, and that is that since 2010, yeah, actually since David Cameron and the Hugger Hoodie, Hugger Husky uh, period of the coalition government, uh, the ONS has been creating satellite accounts which have tried to bring in aspects um, of what I believe you're talking about. And those are the natural capital accounts, the physical flow accounts and the monetary accounts. So what's your perspective on their work in, in that area? Is this the moment that I've been waiting for? Right. Um, <laughs> give, it, give me the opportunity. Because it didn't happen in 2010. Mm -hmm. Actually, the work that... that and, and I would give David Cameron his due in coming out politically with that work, which he did, and, and I really appreciate that. But the work began actually under the previous administration and has been going on for quite a long time under that previous administration. Satellite accounts began to be built by the ONS in 1997. Um, and the building of those accounts has greatly contributed to the information base that policymakers have to make decisions about um, policy and to come up with assessments of our progress towards our economic and social goals. So it's a fantastic resource. I, I have two um, considerations, I suppose, in relation to it. One is that the ONS, although they do a lot of great statistical work, it's not as accessible as it could be and as it should be. And I've worked with statistics sets in, in Canada, in uh, Scandinavia, in Sweden in particular, in Denmark, and, um, and in New Zealand, and I can tell you, you know, in all honesty, that we need to do something about the ONS's statistical interface, the website, basically, because it is very, very difficult to get the statistics that you want out of that, even if you're someone who's worked in it your whole life, much, much more so if you're someone who's 
you know, moving through a policy arena quite fast. The second point, I think, is that, is that interface between the ONS and what ONS does and policy. There is an argument that I could make which would suggest that you know, David Cameron pointing to an already existing set of satellite accounts in the ONS and saying this is what we're doing about measuring progress differently is an avoidance strategy. Unless that act of measuring those accounts, setting up those accounts, providing them in a consistent format, is, crosses into policy, it remains invisible to policy and it, means, it remains very, very difficult for policymakers um, legitimately to be using the information at their disposal in the direction of policy. So that link between the statistical stuff that's going on in the background and you know, everything that's great about that and where policy uses it in practices and directs policy through the information gained is missing. Dr. Agawala, you've been nodding along. Shall I take that as your answer that you agree? Uh, I, I'd like to comment on um, uh, GDP being less politicized than, say, environmental valuation uh, by economists. Or even non -employed, valuing non-employed labor. As well, right. because I mean that's as close as sure. you can get, isn't it? It's, um, it's within the market, but it's just not unpaid. Uh, all accounts, all economic accounts everywhere, are simply tools for telling stories over time. What kinds of stories they're going to tell is a choice. What goes into GDP, and therefore the stories that we get when we look through the GDP accounts about growth, about recessions and depressions. Those do not come out of economic theory. There's not some big calculus equation. What's included in GDP is a political decision. It has always been. When Roosevelt developed GDP statistics from the beginning with, with Simon Kuznets, Roosevelt was president of the commission, um, the economists came back to him and said, well, government spending should have a minus sign, be a negative entry into the account, because what the government spends is something that's been taken from the people, and the people can't spend it. That was the economist's view. Roosevelt was thinking, we might need to take this country to war, and if we have to do that, there's going to be massive expansion of government spending. I think you need to change that to a positive sign. We'll add it to GDP, and that's what happened. Uh, when Greece wanted a loan from the European Central Bank, their debt-to-GDP ratio was too high, too much debt, too little GDP. So what do they do? The national accountants of Greece go back home overnight. They calculate the size of the informal economy in Greece. Illegal drugs and illicit stuff. Yeah? GDP grows 25% overnight. <laughs> the debt to GDP ratio falls. The European Central Bank issues the loan. There's politics throughout all of this, but there's good sound economics behind the way that we measure value as well. So, well I'm sorry for trying to interrupt you earlier on, but it, it, I mean, what we're saying is that there's a huge number of assumptions based in accounts. And some of those are, are codified in you know, the rules for accountants. Hmm? And, and they're something we've, we've sort of coalesced around and they have general acceptance. I suppose my query, I, I don't want to carry on too much about this, is that the, the, the greater we stray from that and expand it into greater and greater assumptions without some kernel of fact, the, 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 the greater we stress and strain the, the need for trust. Um, but just to bring this conversation on a little bit, um, Professor Jackson, what are your, what are the changes to the way that the ONS communicates environmental and social well-being statistics could encourage greater focus, could, could make that link from analysis to macroeconomic policy change. Right. And let me just say that I really like that point about trust, and I think it's correct that if you have a set of institutions which is not trusted, it's difficult to establish policies which are we, we would then progressive. Yeah. In our assessment. Um, I, so, so, so your question is, you know, what could we do? What kinds of measures? I mean, to me, to me, I think you know the, the the bits of the equation that are really important at the moment, as they stand, are the ones that relate to carbon targets 
um, and, and you know, the best of our scientific knowledge is that we have to make rapid progress towards those targets in the space of a decade. And effectively, an advanced economy like the UK should be reaching net zero you know, within the next two decades. Um, and, and that requires us to think very long and hard about the values of carbon-based assets, about the emissions that are coming from carbon-based sources, and about the investments that are going into the transition away from carbon-based sources. And that, that, so that really means that you know, taking into account the value of carbon in the economy is incredibly important, and it is a negative value. So it's a, establishing a price for carbon, which can then be it's, diffused right throughout every economic decision. It's, it's establishing some form of shadow price that will allow you to meet your goals in carbon terms. Yes, indeed. And then integrating that, you know, not just into, um, you know, slapping it on um, instead of or in addition to um, VAT, but actually thinking about where in the economy that shadow price has to be made to work to encourage the investments that you need, to discourage the behaviours that that, um, you want to avoid. I, I would say, you know, and immediately when you begin to think about that, you immediately come up against this question of, of inequality because of the, you know, the large proportion of household budgets amongst lower income households uh, spend a larger proportion of their budgets on carbon and, and energy and fuel. So you immediately come up against it. And I would actually take that inequality point as a separate point because I think it is so important at this point in time. It speaks directly to your point about trust. Unequal societies have lower levels of trust, and the studies on that are very conclusive. And therefore, if you're not measuring that inequality, if you're not factoring that measurement of inequality into your headline measures, into the way that you apply that carbon tax, and indeed into the way that you measure progress, then you're missing a vital piece of the puzzle that can trip you up disastrously later on. Uh, how, how, how pressed are we for time? Because there's another question I'd like to ask. We can get in a quick question, okay. and then we'll move so, to on. Surely, the right approach to that is to apply the price of carbon right across the economy so the market works, because the decisions of, of uh, more disadvantaged people and, and what they spend their money on is just as important in terms of reducing carbon as those of rich people. Um, but that money is not being destroyed, it's being collected. Someone's, someone's collecting that price for carbon, and that becomes, presumably, it's the Treasury. It's a, it's a political choice, then, how that money gets recycled. Isn't it at that stage that you can look at inequality and the, re, the restructuring? Well, you can look at equality in all sorts of different places. You can look at, first of all, by having a less e- unequal society, so you don't have so many poor people who don't have enough money to spend on their fuel. So that's, you know, stage one, if you like, a kind of pre-distribution is really important. You can use those measures. Historically, Treasury has been a little bit antagonistic to what you're suggesting, which is some form of hypothecation. But actually, there's very good evidence to suggest that those kinds of taxes become more acceptable if there is a well-established and visible form of hypothecation. In other words, you know where the money's coming from and you know where the money's going to. Then actually, and we've done studies ourselves on this, people find those kinds of changes and those kinds of policies more acceptable. Yes, finally, Dr. Agawala, we, we've got international standards for accounting and they're based around the UN. Uh, do we have the ability to influence international policy on how we can develop these, these standards? Uh, we, we absolutely do, and now is the time to do it. The UK has always been a leader in uh, pioneering improvements in economic measurement. Um, at the time when it was needed, it was the UK that delivered the GDP, the, the initial version of the SNA. That was uh, uh, Stone and Mead at Cambridge. Um, now the time is needed for natural capital and environmental accounts. And Partha Dasgupta, the late Professor David Pierce, Giles Atkinson, they're the ones that have delivered this um, over the past three decades. Um, the UN Secretary General has advised the Executive Board of the United Nations to develop proposals to him on what it would take to go beyond GDP, what would be the outcome, what would we move towards. Um, Those are expected in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, The system of national accounts, which is the guideline for calculating GDP, is currently undergoing a revision, and that process is increasingly amenable to the idea that we need to incorporate better metrics of human capital 
sort of the health and skills of the population, and natural capital as well. There's place for there's place for the UK to influence that. And the upcoming G20, uh, the uh, head of the T20, which is sort of the technical thing that goes behind it, um, is uh, the former finance minister of Indonesia, and working on precisely these topics. So there are roots for the UK to continue its decades-long leadership in improving the way we measure the economy. And it can do that uh, through the United Nations system. Uh, we've developed a set of ecosystem accounting standards that was released and accepted by the UN Statistics Commission in March of last year. Uh, colleagues at DEFRA and myself actually helped contribute to how we uh, account for air quality in those standards. Uh, so we've got the UN front, we've got the G20 front, uh, and we've got the system of national accounts front. It's incredibly rare that the revisions of these three things come simultaneously. So there is a real chance to deliver this through the UN, the G20, and the SNA now. That's a marvellous conclusion, but we're not quite finished with you yet, I'm afraid. We'd like Caroline Lucas to pick up the battle. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yes, well, keeping with um, Dr. Agawala, we've been talking about the fact that there are already some existing alternative accounting processes out there. And I wanted to ask you whether you think the Treasury in the UK could be making better use of measures that we already have in place to guide macroeconomic policy? I mean, is it a question of political will, or is it a question that whatever state those accounts are in, they're not fit for purpose in terms of, of, of that, um, at that end? Um, there are areas in which UK government has made some progress, so that the levelling up white paper um, that was just released yeah. took as its framework the six capitals approach. This is what I've done for the past decade. Is what Partha Das Gupta has done for the, half cent the, the last half century. That's very exciting. But it excluded natural capital. <laughs> On the grounds that, well, we've got some other stuff that deals with natural capital elsewhere. That ignores the portfolio approach. That, that's a missed opportunity. It needs to be corrected. Why, why do you think that happened? <laughs> you can be candid. No, no one will uh, hear what you say. To be honest, I genuinely don't know. Uh, why they took, they, they cited my work, they cited Partha Dasgupta's work, why they took natural capital out. I, I don't understand what, has, what we have done wrong in communicating the importance of all of the assets being measured in the pantry simultaneously. Yes, the UK has developed its natural capital committee, and that was a great thing to do, and it has the natural environment white paper, and that brings in the natural capital approach. But it should be incorporated through the leveling up strategy. Um, the UK is now the world's largest sovereign issuer of green bonds. We have 16 billion pounds worth of green bonds that were raised last year, and those were massively oversubscribed, which means not only were they cheap gilts for us to borrow, but there's more where that came from. We have to report on the progress of those bonds. We have to report every year on the allocation of those bonds across projects, and we have to report every two years on the environmental and social benefits that those investments generate. And the Treasury is currently working on developing its reporting framework for that. Um, we have work ongoing at universities all across the UK that would really help improve the scientific underpinnings of the environmental reporting that the green gilts could have. And if we do that well, we can corner the market because every asset manager out there is looking for credible ESG credentials. And if we can demonstrate, hey, we've got the best scientists in the world underpinning our green gilts reporting mechanism, that's going to be a huge advantage for us on that market. And we do have that science here. We have better land use models in this country than essentially any other country on the planet. Um, our biodiversity modeling, our carbon modeling, our measurements here in the UK are really very high quality. We should integrate this through the Treasury's work. Lovely, thank you. Um, I wanted to come to Tim Jackson and, and play devil's advocate here, and let me just stress that is what I'm doing, but there will be some who would say that, um, that since tax revenues are tied to income and spending, 
would it be economically disastrous for a government to deprioritise GDP growth? What would your answer be on that? Um, I would I would say that the government certainly has the responsibility to figure out what's going on with the GDP, and, I, and perhaps this is something that we should say because it hasn't been mentioned before. Matthew mentioned the, the benefits of GDP growth, but the GDP as a measure is actually you know, quite a sophisticated thing. It allows you to match up expenditures on the one hand with incomes on the other hand and the value added of your economy. And all of those things miraculously come together in this system of national accounts. And it's a really good way of figuring out what's going on in the economy, what's happening to your labour productivity in that economy, what your tax receipts might be from incomes and from various places in that economy. It's a good accounting tool for those purposes. So this, any of the work that is being talked about here is not a call to disband or to, to deny the existence or the value of the GDP in that form of being an accounting measure and a useful accounting measure for government. Its failures lie in its ability to measure uh, the distribution of those goods and services and incomes and in its failure to measure the changes in the asset base on which that future flow of goods and services can be provided and in its failure to measure the distribution I think I said distribution already um, and in the impacts for example the impacts of our, our um, production of goods and services on the environment those are all really important failures now your question and it's a really good question is, is how do we go forwards in that situation knowing that we are guiding ourselves on with using a measure that is no longer sufficient for purposes in the complications of the society that we exist in, in the face of our social and environmental goals, some of which are you know, incredibly um, pressing, and in which we have built a set of institutions that is to some extent dependent on that growth in the GDP. And, and that really is my answer to your question, that the starting point in figuring out the implications of moving to a different measure, not abandoning the GDP, but definitely measuring things differently, um, is, to, is to work out where those gross dependencies exist, how pressing they are, and how we could do otherwise. So, for example, and this is again an area where we've done some work, um, if you look at gross dependency in, in the welfare sector, as you say, the conventional model has been that tax receipts provide the income for the spending that we, um, through which we can develop care services, health services, education, and so on and so forth. And that does require some thought. But if you, our, our approach to that is essentially that you have to take a structured approach. You have to understand three factors in that growth dependency. What is the demand for those welfare services and how is that welfare demand structured? What is the cost structure of those services? and how, what dynamics within those cost structures create a growth imperative. And second of all, and, and third, that within the structure of the financialization of those services, where you might find social and political interests and economic interests, particularly rent-seeking behaviors, that make those services more and more costly into the future and drive your growth imperative. So it's a process of understanding what is driving the need for a growth in spending in the welfare economy and how is that welfare spending to be, um, to be met, to be financed. And if you take a very simple example of the social care sector where we've done some work, you, know, you, can, you can look at that in relation to those rising demand, the cost dynamic, which is a very difficult cost dynamic because care doesn't typically lay itself, lend itself to productivity improvements. And therefore, you find yourself with a rising cost for um, the work in care within those sectors. And then the political situation is that you then, you know, as a government, you look at that and you see those rising costs and you think, what's the solution to this? And you say, well, the best solution is probably the market, so let's financialize social care. And then you find that you've created a kind of horror in which private equity companies are siphoning public money to provide a social good and putting into bank accounts in, in the Cayman Islands. And that's, you know, we know that that is happening. So my point here is to say that when we, when we address this question, we have to first of all understand that we have built growth dependent architectures. Second of all, unravel those. And then in the unraveling of those to put into place 
what I would argue we have to be doing anyway for a reason that we haven't yet mentioned, putting in place post-growth architectures. What does a post-growth welfare state look like? And I would argue that we have to answer that question not just because of carbon emissions and the environment, not just because of inequality, but because the economic evidence tells us that productivity growth in the UK and in most advanced economies has been declining since the mid-1960s. And before the pandemic, even, it was hovering just below zero in the UK, which means essentially that we are already living in a post-GDP growth environment. We can continue to inflate that GDP growth if we want to by having people working longer hours in the economy, by having more immigration if we would like that. But we cannot really avoid that historical trajectory which says that we have to be thinking about what happens after GDP growth. And your question is one of the most important ones to think about in that. What happens to the welfare state in a post-growth economy? And I would argue that we don't have easy answers to that, but we do have a systematic way of analysing what the problems are. And some of those problems arise from things which are imminently and eminently correctable, such as the perverse structure of financialization of social care. Thank you, Caroline. Before we go to Duncan for our last set of questions, I think Robert Goodwill had a very quick yeah, follow-up. Just a quick point following on what you just said, Professor Jackson. Would you agree that we're actually starting to see this emerging already? Because, for example, as people are starting to buy electric cars, we're seeing revenues from vehicle excise duty and fuel duty falling and we're going to get into a situation where we're encouraging people to do green things and to have less of an impact on the environment to do things that maybe have more social value than maybe economic value but they're just the things we don't want to tax because we don't want to discourage people and how can the government square that circle in terms of having the revenue they need to provide the services that people want? Yeah I, I would agree that we're already in that situation. The transition to net zero is such a fundamental transition of, of industrial infrastructure, of, of people's lifestyles and indeed of the policy environment that we can't expect to navigate that without having to rethink some of those really tricky issues. And of course, sometimes there will be trade-offs. But there will also be, you know, to some extent, some unintended positives because actually if you transition, for example, from a situation where you're taxing, um, largely taxing carbon fuel as, as an income source to a situation where you're arguing rightly that the road is an infrastructure that has to be maintained, that it has um, limited capacity, that having more crowded roads actually is to the detriment of our health and sometimes to our budget as well, then moving from a trans transitioning from a taxing fuels to a taxing the use of the road system is not out with the reasoning of what we need to engage in sensibly if we're thinking about a transition as radical as the net zero tra transition is. I thought you might have read my article in the Yorkshire Post a couple of weeks back. I saw yeah. the news article. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the oracle speaks. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Duncan Baker. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I look forward to reading that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to come on to um, Professor uh, Dasgupta's uh, review and, and start off um, with you, Professor Jackson. Uh, the Dasgupta review of the economics of biodiversity concluded that GDP-led economic policy did not account for the depreciation of natural assets. That's something that we, we well know. Uh, and he had a, an alternative uh, proposal, inclusive wealth, and I know you, you commented on that. Perhaps you could just share with the committee um, what you think of that proposal. Uh, yes, I mean, the inclusive wealth um, measure, as I understand it, is very much the kind of measure that Matthew has described, which is to say that there are certain kinds of assets which remain invisible to the GDP, but on which our progress in, in any term, terms depends, and that an inclusive uh, wealth measure would measure the changes in those assets assign a price to the changes in those assets and then look at whether we are depleting assets or accumulating assets in the economy. And that would contribute to our sense of, of progress in the economy. And, and I think that is one of the elements of uh, the change in accounting system that we need. I would comment, I think only that I find the term inclusive in the inclusive wealth measure slightly misleading because it doesn't refer to inclusiveness in any 
social sense and, and it misses essentially therefore that point that I was making earlier that the distribution of incomes, the distribution of goods and services, the distribution of environmental and social harms matters in society. And so as a part of uh, a change in the way that we measure our progress, I think the work that's been done around the Inclusive Wealth Index is really important. Yeah, okay. uh, we've had uh, Professor Daskup to come and talk to our, uh, our select committee before. It was a fascinating uh, session. Uh, that work that was performed for the Treasury, I mean, how effective do you think the government's response has been to the, his review to date? Um, if I'm being charitable, I would say it's too soon to tell. Um, it hasn't been, I think, as uh, as warm a welcome as, as it could be. Um, we need to start measuring these assets. Um, we need to start using those measurements when we define what progress looks like. And we need to start using those measurements when we develop policies. Uh, and I think we're not quite there yet. Um, the exclusion of natural capital from the leveling up white paper is a demonstration of that. Yep. On the other hand, the inclusion of the capital's framework in the, that same white paper is progress. Um, there's going to be a learning process that we need to go through as we start to implement these ideas. Uh, and we're at the beginning of that. I think it could be faster, should be faster. What sort of time scale would you put on it? Because we are still very historical, very set in our ways of what, how we measure it. I mean, how do, you, how do you see that realistically changing and over what sort of period of time? I think we could do it with inside this parliament. We, 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 we could have uh, reports. Um, we could have uh, you as leaders coming out and saying, what really counts to measure the progress of the country is not just GDP growth, mm -hmm. it's whether or not we are growing that economic pantry and, as Professor Jackson points out very clearly and many times over, it's not just that we're growing the pantry but that we are increasing access to it, that it's distributed, that people are able to take advantage of these assets and these resources. The, the real issue is that if we continue on with GDP and the diversion, the gap between what GDP explains about the world and what real people and families experience day to day continues to grow, then all of this trust that we have in national statistics that Jerome was speaking about disappears. And we have a measuring device that describes an economy that doesn't really exist because it ignores nature and it ignores social capital, and for a group of people that it doesn't have any relevance to, and that's a real problem. So we need to start doing this. Um, and I think that what it's difficult to, uh, to make this point strongly enough. Um, we need forward-looking measures. We need to understand what's going on in that pantry, those assets. That is the, inclusive wealth. That's what Das Gupta writes about. Um, they're forward-looking. That's the only way. If we know what these assets are doing, then we know whether we have them at our disposal, whether we can use them to generate prosperity long into the future. The difference between using wealth versus GDP as a measure of the economy is the difference between getting a backwards after-the-fact diagnosis at an autopsy from a coroner versus getting one ahead of time from the doctor in their surgery that you can then treat. We need our statistics to help us behave like doctors, not coroners. And at present, they don't. No. And, I, and that's incumbent on us parliamentarians to be pushing and, and raising that, because frankly, at the moment, I don't feel it's there at all. I mean, do you, do you share 
Well, let, on terms no. of timing, maybe we could get that fixed before I come back for my fourth appearance in front of the <laughs> Environmental Audit Committee on this issue. I haven't been in Parliament very long, but I can tell you one thing, nothing seems to happen very quickly. I, I mean, I do think, I do think you know, there is, a, there is a responsibility on, on, on government, there's a responsibility on leadership, there's a responsibility on Parliament to take these issues forwards, and they've been kicked down the road, sometimes claiming credit for, for some, some of the kicking in the wrong places, as I've pointed out, for as long as I have been working on these issues, and probably Probably a lot more and I think that we've run out of road I would argue and uh, for all sorts of reasons um, not the least of which is the is the secular stagnation that I was alluding to that the growth isn't going to be there in quite the way that we hoped it might be but also of course the transition to net zero and the drastic inequality that is undermining the trust on which the political process depends and so you know, kind of, if you're looking after the integrity of your own job, jobs in Parliament and, and your licence to operate as, as part of a democratic set of institutions, then it is incumbent on Parliament and on government to, to move and not to kick down the, the can down the road, not to engage in avoidance strategies like the ONS is doing this, and not to do as was done when I submitted a report from the Sustainable Development Commission, which the Environmental Audit Committee, and I love the work that you do here, forced the government to respond to yep. and their response was we welcome the report from the sustainable development commission it was literally one line and um i have it framed I think that's a very good uh, segue on which to uh, finish this panel because we're having a rather better uh, track record at getting recommendations taken forward by government than perhaps our predecessor committee very was when you were here last time i uh, thank you duncan i'm going to draw that panel to a conclusion and thank you very much Professor Tim Jackson and Dr. Matthew Agawala for a really fascinating session. Uh, thank you very much. We'll move on now to the second panel. Thank you very much. The proceeding is currently suspended.